We are now two years into the COVID pandemic. From overcrowded hospitals and overstressed healers to vaccine effectiveness and the resistance to them. Find out what you need to do to be safe and to keep others safe from COVID. Now on the Inside Story, pandemic year three. I'm Carolyn Prasuti, reporting from VOA's global headquarters in Washington. It was around this time in January 2020 when we started hearing reports of a novel coronavirus discovered in China. Two years later, about 350 million COVID cases have been reported worldwide. More than five and a half million people have died from COVID. Vaccines have been effective, keeping most people safe from severe illness but they do not provide bulletproof protection. With two years worth of lessons learned, how will we deal with year three? Well, we start in London, where researchers are learning more about how the common cold may protect us from its deadlier cousin. Here's Henry Redwell. It's a question that has puzzled scientists. Why are some people able to resist coronavirus infection despite prolonged exposure? So researchers at Imperial College of London set out to test a theory that a type of white blood cells called T cells produced by the human body to fight the common cold could offer some protection. Report co-author Professor Ajit Lalvani. Previous infection with uh common cold coronaviruses. So these are uh, distantly related cousins of SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID. So that such endemic common cold causing coronaviruses, that infection with those uh, might induce T cells that would be able to cross recognize um, and then attack the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so that was the theory we set about to test. The study began in September 2020, before any mass vaccination programs and before most people had been infected with COVID. Scientists tested the blood of 52 people who lived in the same household as someone infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID. Half of those sampled contracted COVID, while half did not. And what we found was that those contacts who had pre-existing T cells uh, that could um, that were induced by common cold coronavirus, but cross recognize and attack SARS-CoV-2, people with such T cells didn't get infected. Current vaccines are designed to trigger an immune response that targets the spike proteins on the outside of the coronavirus that are able to mutate and escape immunity. In contrast, the T cells we discovered that mediate this protection are directed against proteins in the core of the virus, internal proteins, and these proteins are much less changeable. So essentially our findings provide the blueprint uh, for developing a universal T cell inducing vaccine to protect people against current and all future variants of COVID. An exciting prospect, but development of such a vaccine remains some way off. Meanwhile, the report authors emphasize that no one should rely on a common cold infection to provide immunity against COVID and say vaccination offers the best protection. Henry Ridgewell for VUA News, London. After discovering the Omicron variant could infect fully vaccinated people, at-home COVID tests helped many to decide whether it was safe to interact with others. In the U.S., there were not enough to meet the sudden demand, forcing President Biden to admit his administration fell short and will mail 500 million at-home testing kits to families who request them. The goal is to identify new infections, but there is concern about the accuracy of the tests. VOA's Veronica Balderas Iglesias explains. Jordan Irby and his partner, Julia Weil, visit COVID-19 testing sites often, 
We get tested so that we can see our friends without being concerned that we're spreading COVID. They'd rather have someone who's trained take samples for a lab instead of relying on at-home tests. The while has used self-tests before visiting elderly relatives. The process itself was pretty easy, but I wasn't confident about what the results said. Her instinct was right. In 2020, researchers found that in people with COVID symptoms, the antigen tests were less accurate than the PCR tests, which can take a lab 48 hours to process. We directly compared the Binax Now antigen test to the gold standard PCR test. The antigen test missed detecting 20% of all COVID-19 cases. There's no conclusive data yet on how well rapid antigen tests work on the Omicron variant, but people can take steps to be more confident in the results. As is, they catch about four in five positive cases. Testing too early in the infection is discouraged. If you're testing while you're symptomatic and you have a bad cold symptoms and you have a lot of virus in your system, you're more likely to, to be accurate in that situation. We do uh, often recommend multiple rapid tests, so not just one test, but you do your antigen test today, maybe test it again in 24 or 36 hours. Dr. Peter Chen Hong, a professor of medicine in California, says pay close attention to the swabbing technique when testing at home. Depending on the platform, you swab at least five to ten times on each side um, and then uh, you put it in the reagent and then you just basically have to time it. Not look too soon because it may be falsely negative and not look too late because they may be uh, unstable uh, chemicals. President Joe Biden's administration has promised 500 million COVID test kits for American households soon and local governments are rushing to open new testing sites. They encourage patients to report positives to their health care providers. But they also emphasize testing is only one part of the answer to containing the virus. We still caution our residents and people around the world to follow steps to prevent the spread of COVID-19 regardless of whether or not they have a negative test. And that's maintaining social distancing, wearing a mask when indoors with people outside of your immediate household, and most importantly, to get vaccinated. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Arlington, Virginia. About 62% of the world's population has received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine. Getting to 100% fully vaccinated, including booster shots, means more vaccines are going to be needed. VOA's Steve Barragona takes us to Houston, Texas, where a new vaccine is being developed to distribute specifically in lower and middle income countries. The new vaccine developed at Baylor College of Medicine is 90% effective against the original COVID-19 coronavirus and 80% against the Delta variant. Data on Omicron is coming. The vaccine is also cheap, refrigerator stable and easy to manufacture in developing countries, says team co-lead Dr. Peter Hotez. So when you start going down the checklist, this checks all the boxes for what you need for a global health vaccine. Hotez and colleagues use the same old tried and true technology that they've used to develop vaccines against neglected tropical diseases, those that big pharma is less inclined to treat, because that's what's most available to vaccine makers in low and middle income countries, he says. That's why I was so disheartened at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was focusing on new technologies. I knew that would be a barrier to access. Wealthier nations poured money into making new technology vaccines. Now about 80 percent of people in upper income countries have been vaccinated, but only about 10 percent in low income countries have. And Hotez and colleagues are making the vaccine available without patents. He says intellectual property rights just get in the way during a global crisis. If your house is on fire and you can only have time to make one phone call, you don't call a patent attorney, you call the fire department and, and we're the fire department. The Indian government recently authorized the vaccine, and Indian company Biological E is making hundreds of millions of doses a month under the name Corbivax. Companies in Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Botswana are planning production too. But it's not clear whether Corbivax will hold up as well as the new technology vaccines against the Omicron variant, 
says Johns Hopkins University vaccine expert Dr. William Moss. The Sinopharm, Sinovac vaccines, those are an older technology. They are not doing well against Omicron. Very much reduced vaccine effectiveness. Global supplies of other vaccines are improving. The United Nations-backed COVAX program recently delivered its one billionth dose. Big drug makers are promising billions more doses this year. And other new vaccines are entering the market. But if it holds up against variants, a low-cost vaccine like Corbivax will still be useful because COVID-19 will be with us for years to come, Moss says. We'll be kind of uh, transitioning into this kind of endemic mode and more routine vaccination, and that's where these vaccines may, pl may play a role. Experts say a regular shot against multiple COVID-19 strains could be in everyone's future. The less it costs, the better. Steve Barragona, VOA News. Police in Brussels fired water cannons and tear gas at 50,000 protesters demonstrating last week against COVID-19 vaccinations and restrictions. European authorities imposed those regulations to try to contain the fast-spreading Omicron variant of the coronavirus. Battle lines over vaccine mandates are being drawn as well in some parts of the United States. And in South Africa, where the Omicron variant was first identified, Vaccine mandates to return to school are being debated and fought. Our Linda Givtash report. ...are gearing up for a new school year as the country emerges from its fourth wave of the coronavirus pandemic. And COVID vaccines will be a prerequisite for many returning to campus. The South African Union of Students has warned protests of vaccine mandates are looming. At the University of Johannesburg, students say they're angry that they weren't consulted and claim the policies infringe on their constitutional rights to bodily integrity. Students must go to vaccinate under their free will. There, there, there's no one who is in a, a bio bubble. So whether you are vaccinated or not, uh, the moment you leave campus to do your grocery shopping or go anywhere else, you, you come across uh, people who are vaccinated and who are not vaccinated. Less than half of South African adults have been inoculated, and there is no national vaccine mandate in place. The reasons behind vaccine hesitancy are complex. Students say their decisions are made on personal preference, cultural and religious beliefs, despite there being no evidence such methods protect against COVID-19. From the first wave, I've stuck to African home remedies. Um, I haven't been hospitalized, I've never tested positive. And I think because that worked for me thus far, I will continue with that remedy. People who have vaccinated are said to have been protected from the virus, and they should find ease in that. They shouldn't be bothered by the fact that someone else is choosing to not vaccinate and exercise that right. Vaccines do protect people, especially against severe disease. But one of the country's top doctors says unvaccinated people pose other risks beyond catching or spreading COVID-19. They are much more likely to end up in hospital, in ICU, and to die of COVID-19. And ending up in hospital is not just a burden that's, that individual assumes. It's a burden that is shared across society, both in terms of the funding of the healthcare system, as well as other impacts that materialize in that hospital when there's needing to start to cut back on, as an example, elective surgery, because health, health care facilities are coming under pressure. Which is why he's calling for tougher measures on those resisting the shots. All choices come with consequences. And that's the whole point, is that a mandatory vaccination doesn't mean that we're going to tie you down or put you in prison uh, if you choose not to be vaccinated. It should come with consequences, just like there are consequences to every other choice that one makes in life. For unvaccinated students, it's losing access to campus. The University of Johannesburg said in a statement that exemptions will be considered on health or religious grounds. Exempt students will have to provide a negative COVID test each week. If they aren't granted an exemption, students fear what being barred from campus will mean about their future. If I'm refusing to vaccinate because it goes against my will and whatever it is that I believe and the institution wants to protect me, then we must find means to find common ground. If it means I have to go for testing every week, if it means I have to screen every two hours, then so be it. But means must be made. They can't take away my right to an education because I don't want to vaccinate. 
The University of Johannesburg says students can always regain access to campus once they get their shot. Linda Giftash for VOA News, Johannesburg. Every level of the healthcare profession is being challenged by the COVID pandemic, from the treatment of emergency room doctors and nurses to the fair and equal treatment of patients. Lakshmi Krishnan is an assistant professor of medicine and director of Georgetown University Medical Humanities Initiative. I spoke with her about pandemic fatigue in healthcare. From my personal observations is that COVID whether it's Omicron or another variant, remains a multi-system inflammatory disease. That means it affects all the organ systems. It affects them sort of unpredictable, unpredictably. Um, it can worsen existing conditions. It can disrupt an existing balance. And at-risk folks, even if vaccinated, can get very, very, very ill. Does it seem to attack people who already have those underlying conditions more than not? So it can tip over the balance of any of those um, underlying conditions, absolutely. And then we see a, a kind of domino effect where COVID plus these other comorbidities or underlying conditions can turn into um, a pretty profound clinical spiral. So is more vaccination the answer when people are seeing so many breakthrough cases? It doesn't seem to matter if you have if you've been double vaccinated, if you've already had the booster, people are still getting Omicron. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Um, we, I will always evangelize for more vaccination because it certainly is protective against extremely severe disease. One heartening sign that we did see was that our ICUs were not as full as they were 2020. So yes, People are getting very sick. Yes, people, uh, you know, again, please know that I am, I am biased because I see very ill patients on the inpatient side. But um, I cannot imagine how much sicker some of these folks would have been um, had they not been vaccinated and not been boosted. Um, and again, for those who are generally healthy, generally well, otherwise, we're preventing hospitalization. Um, and that is incredibly important as we've learned from a health system capacity standpoint, not to clog up our hospitals with the sort of mild or moderately ill because uh, those who have severe illness require those services um, and, our, and our systems are really struggling under the strain. Will we just be in this spiral? Will COVID be endemic that we just see other variants pop up? I know Omicron in some countries now is going down, the numbers of Omicron cases. Um, so once it makes its exit, then do we see another variant? Will this just be life as normal? So just as a historical example, cholera was considered endemic in South Asia and the Indian subcontinent and is still endemic in parts of the global south. But cholera was considered unacceptably epidemic in the United Kingdom. So as rates declined in the West and remained static with breakthroughs, um, in the global south, because that can still happen with endemicity. Um, you know, we see this again with the more recent example of HIV AIDS. I'm, I'm old enough to remember um, the transition for us in the Western consciousness, thinking about HIV AIDS as an acute epidemic with outbreaks, um, to now we consider it a chronic treatable disease, but it is endemic in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so the differences in, the, in those understandings, we can see how epidemic and endemic fit certain racial, political, and economic agendas. What did you see yeah. on the floors there? Quite a few of my patients who were often either elderly or patients of color did not have tech devices that allowed video conferencing or FaceTiming, you know, these things that many of us take for granted. And again, for the elderly, just figuring out how to use this technology is really hard. And because they're in these isolation rooms, we're sort of putting it on the patients. Um, and though we have some digital tech on the floors, it frequently doesn't work, unfortunately, or it's in limited supply. Um, and we are also trying to minimize going in and out of, say, COVID positive rooms. So it's really hard for us um, to offer patients a way to, to routinely be in touch with and see their families. And this is the emotional piece. I saw patients who I met, say, at the beginning of my stint, who were just visibly dwindling from a depression standpoint, 
um, over the course of the hospitalization because they they miss their family. Um, they miss that human interaction. Um, so we talked about the tech inequities in the hospital, but what other healthcare adjustments need to be changed to help people of color in their fight with COVID? Really, I think it really reached um, an important pitch during the early days of the vaccine rollout where we saw inequities in terms of the distribution um, and also access to vaccines. So it's multi-pronged. There's no single answer. Um, but I think, you know, along the lines of education, access, um, and, and, and then sort of not letting up, right? It's not a single, it, like, it's not a single effort. So... My hope is that um, as COVID mutates, these new variants are going to continue to become less dangerous, less, um, you know, less severe. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if that's for sure. Um, but that is, that is one thing that does give me hope. Two years of COVID has taken a toll on societies around the world. School and graduation disruptions, grandparents who can't see their grandchildren, the celebration of life's milestones scaled back or postponed. The Lunar New Year is upon us, and Asian American communities in the U.S. are determined to not let COVID upend their party. From Los Angeles, here's VOA's Michael O'Sullivan. Some of the usual Lunar New Year parades and festivals in the United States are canceled, as they were last year. But the San Francisco Chinatown Parade resumes after a one-year gap. We are cautiously optimistic to proceed forward with a live parade. So yeah, we are, we're very excited to actually have a live event this, uh, this year. That's good news for a man who leads a lion dance troupe, a traditional form of entertainment. For us, it's a tradition that we ring in the New Year, just like the American New Year, where often all the fireworks go off. His troop will take part in the parade this year, vaccinated and masked. It is the year of the tiger, and another year of COVID, this time the Omicron variant. And in San Francisco's Chinatown, the largest outside Asia, some plan to delay the usual New Year gatherings. We talked about it, and. Uh, it discussed it and said, we're going to celebrate six months later. The Lunar New Year is usually a busy time for Chinatown businesses and restaurants, but not this year due to the pandemic. We've had probably 90% cancellations uh, for this period. Usually we've got lots of events. But his restaurant will stay open and he expects a surge in takeout orders as families celebrate at home. Supply chain problems and shortages have also had an impact, hurting this family-run business that sells ritual items and decorations from China. The shipping through the ship, the container, takes a lot longer than usual. Creating shortages of some holiday goods and specialty foods. In Los Angeles Chinatown, people are also ready, and the Chinatown parade is still on track. People pray for better times in the year of the tiger. As one temple prepares to welcome holiday visitors, in Southern California's Little Saigon neighborhood, they are ready to welcome the year of an animal known for bravery and strength, but also its cruelty. Facing another challenging year, a Vietnamese section of Northern Virginia is bustling. But sponsors have canceled a Chinatown parade in the nation's capital, creating a virtual program instead due to COVID. Mike O'Sullivan, VOA News, Los Angeles. And a happy Lunar New Year to all. That's all for us now. Follow me on Twitter at Carolyn VOA and follow VOA News on Instagram and Facebook. Online, stay up to date at voanews.com. For all of those behind the scenes who brought you today's show, I'm Carolyn Persuti. Thanks for joining us. See you next week for the Inside Story.